Welcome to the PowerPoint lecture series on the American legal system. This first part of this lecture PowerPoint series is on sovereignty, which is the fundamental underpinning of all legal systems. Sovereignty is the foundation of all law. It's the lawful authority of a nation or a country and in diplomatic terms, a country or nation is referred to as a state. I know that can get a little confusing because we have states and a country, uh, but uh, diplomatically speaking, every uh, governmental unit that is a nation is referred to as a state. Celtic legend has it that sovereignty is a goddess of the well. If you think about riding through a, a bleak and stony land with no water uh, and you just have one water bottle on you, you need to travel from drinking water source to drinking water source. And the person who controls that well effectively establishes the law for all the territory within the day's ride of that well. If the goddess of the well says you're only allowed to reach her water, to use her water by following certain rules, then you need to follow those rules anywhere within the realm of uh, the distance where you need to access her well. And that is the origins of the word sovereignty. Today, we don't tend to think of sovereignty as the goddess of the well, but the concept remains the same. It's the authorization to govern and make laws within a territory. Now, if you don't happen to be a goddess in charge of a well, how do you get sovereignty? It can be established and maintained by power, might makes right, um, or by recognition, that is by other countries um, establishing that you in fact um, are authorized, to, that you do have that authority. And usually it's a combination of those two. Power, it means, you know, force of arms, where you actually take a territory and then maintain it against all challengers by setting up border patrols and, and uh, putting your armed guards at the, at the boundaries and at all bridges and at all paths into the country. Uh, recognition means having other nations formally agree that you're the sovereign of that region. Can you think of any areas in the world today where a group is attempting to secure sovereignty by power, by force of arms? And can you think of any areas of the world where sovereignty is in dispute because different nations and organizations either don't recognize the sovereign or the boundaries are at issue? Take a moment and think about those. So you can pause this, uh, this recording until you have a minute to, to think about that. So here are some examples. Right now, uh, ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, is one example of an area in the world where an armed group is declared a sovereign state. They've actually declared a caliphate. And they're attempting to secure and maintain that caliphate by force of arms. Thus far, as far as I know, um, no other established nation has recognized ISIS as the legitimate sovereign government of that area. Um, if, however, they were able to fully secure uh, that area, and you know, they in areas that they have secured, at least over the last couple of years, um, they've gone ahead and instituted many of the functions of government. They have garbage running and traffic and they're doing highway maintenance and the buses are running, things like that. So those are you know, governmental functions that have been taken over by them. Um, although that has waxed and waned and my understanding is at the moment they hold very little territory. And then there are quite a few places in the world where sovereign boundaries and the extent of recognition by other nations is disputed. I gave you a few examples here, Cyprus, Israel and Palestine, Kashmir, Crimea, and indeed other areas of the Ukraine and Hong Kong are all examples of disputed sovereignty or disputed boundaries. 
Since nations are sovereign, there is no one global legal authority other than what sovereign nations have joined together and agreed to in the form of treaties and conventions like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, trade agreements like NAFTA, or agreements as to the rules of war like the Geneva Convention. Some of these international agreements establish limits of sovereignty on the open ocean, in the Arctic and Antarctica, as well as in outer space. It's generally agreed that nations have exclusive territorial sovereignty for 12 nautical miles from shore, and then what is called an exclusive economic zone for 200 nautical miles from their shores. So China has developed an extremely creative method of expanding their territorial limits in the ocean. They are building artificial islands in the South China Sea, about 180 nautical miles from shore, which will then theoretically become their outer coastal limits, which pushes both their territorial and economic limits outward. Federalism, as we have in the United States, is a system of dual sovereignty. In the US, you always live in two sovereign states at the same time. The United States and your state, or the District of Columbia, or with certain other limitations, some of the other American territories like Puerto Rico, American Samoa, or Guam. In some areas of the country, you may actually live in three sovereign states, uh, or at least there is a third quasi-sovereign state in addition to the U.S. and your state like Vermont. Can you guess what that is? Again, you can pause this and take a moment if you want to take a guess. So the third quasi-sovereign state in the U.S. is Indian reservations. Indian reservations are quasi-sovereign entities. By treaty with these First Nations, certain spheres of sovereignty were agreed to be held by tribes that have Bureau of Indian Affairs recognition. Such tribes can have tribal laws and courts to enforce those laws and can make their own rules within tribal lands. So Indian reservations have their own police forces, their own courts, and um, this is why you'll see things like casino development on Indian lands, even though it would not be lawful in the state it's in, like the uh, casino in uh, Connecticut, for example. Municipalities, which is most people's guess as to the third sovereignty, are not sovereign. They are called, quote, creatures of the state. That is, they're created by the state and they're chartered with certain powers. You might remember, for example, a few years ago, Burlington was trying to pass some firearms laws about, for example, not having guns in bars. And, but uh, it was ruled that exceeds their charter, the city charter for Burlington. The state of Vermont is the only entity that can make rules regarding, um, regarding carrying firearms. And they haven't given the towns and the city of Burlington the authorization to do that. So organizations and private entities and private landowners certainly have control over their own uh, lands and facilities and clubs can have some control over their own membership. And that sounds a little bit like sovereignty. Uh, however, they're not actually governments. So, you know, churches or social clubs can adopt their own rules, have hearings, kick out members for violating those rules if they want to. And some religious organizations even have hearing bodies called courts, such as the Catholic canonical courts. And private landowners can make rules about, you know, use of their land and put up no trespassing signs. But those are all subject to the laws of the sovereign states in which they operate. 
Uh, for example, you can't engage in discrimination in your membership or in your uh, trespassing rules regarding your property. You can't let certain classes of people in and not others because that would violate state and federal constitutions. And what is a constitution? Well, that's a thing that actually constitutes the sovereign entity. And that will be the next fundamental underpinning of law that we'll talk about in the next PowerPoint lecture on constitutions.